The development of China will bring more opportunities to Africa, and the development of Africa will bring a new energy to the development of China. President Xi goes to Africa. The Chinese leader visits four African countries and the United Arab Emirates to strengthen ties and promote development. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. Four visits in five years, Chinese President Xi Jinping has made Africa a priority of his presidency. This time he is visiting Senegal, Rwanda and South Africa before a stopover in Mauritius. He visited the United Arab Emirates on his way to the African continent. African leaders are eager to greet the Chinese president as the promise of Chinese investment means access and opportunity for their people. While some critics warn that China's involvement on the continent is a modern form of colonialism, many African leaders welcome the economic partnerships. The many practitioners and amateurs of Senegalese wrestling have always dreamed of a national arena. Today, thanks to the supportive cooperation of our Chinese friends, reality has surpassed the dream. Since this beautiful complex with its versatility will host wrestling matches, but also other sporting and social cultural activities. From sporting arenas to airports, there's no doubt China is investing in Africa. So to discuss President Xi's visit, Chen 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 joins us from Beijing. She is deputy director of the Macro Research Department in the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University. With us in the studio, Abdullahi Boru Ahlaki is a security and policy analyst focusing on Africa. From Cologne in Germany, Alexander de Misse is founding director of the China Africa Advisory and Edmund Garib is a scholar specializing in Middle East affairs. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Chen Chen Chen, let me start with you in Beijing. This is President Xi's fourth visit in five years to Africa. He's also hosted a number of uh, African leaders. Clearly, Africa and Africans are a priority. Why are China-Africa relations so important for this president? Uh, well, I think there is currently a general consensus among Africa experts in Chinese academia that those who embrace Africa embrace the future. If you look at the statistics of GDP growth in the second decade of the 21st century, especially since the 2008 financial crisis, you can see that African economies are literally among the most stably uh, growing uh, and vigorous economies. Uh, and uh, more importantly, they are enjoying not just the economic vigor, but there are, we are witnessing the emergence of a group of uh, countries with national confidence. That is quite important. Uh, from the global architecture, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, current, current architecture as shifting, a uh, focus shifting from the uh, traditional, so-called traditional global north to global south, of course, emerging countries like China and African economies uh, they are literally serving as the driving force for the next round of global growth. So uh, considering all these elements, I would say uh, these uh, new lands of opportunities are the uh, destinations of investment, are the target of not just China, but also all other global partners. That is uh, actually the essence of the uh, message that President Xi is trying to deliver. Abdullahi, uh, during his first visit to Africa in 2013, President Xi declared that China and Africa, using his words here, have a shared future. Unpack that as for us. What does a shared future mean for China and for African nations? I think uh, I just want to pick up from where my colleague left. Yeah. Uh, for a very long time, Africa has been seen as a problem to be solved. But what China has come and brought to the table is, no, Africa is not a problem to be solved. Africa is an opportunity that can be shared collectively. Uh, the global you know, order that we have is post-1945 global world order. It's an order that is under tremendous amount of strain um, with what is going on in Brexit, with what is going on in the United States, with what is going on in some of the you know, European countries, with the rise of far-right um, political parties. Africa now looks as if they're losing out, ideally, but it's now taking advantage of that. And with, when China comes, it doesn't come with 
tremendous amount of conditionalities to some of these countries. It is building roads, it's building bridges, it's building airports, it's building power. And so for a tremendous amount of Africans, this is an opportunity to ride. Finally, if you look at the demographics in most of the African countries, the median age is 17.4. This is a demographic dividend that is not for now, it's for the future. So when Chi is speaking, he's speaking about a collective shared future where you know, Africa and China will look at each other as equals. Alexander, what are your thoughts on the relationship, the growing relationship between China uh, and Africa? President Xi, of course, will be visiting four countries, Senegal, Rwanda, South Africa, where he will be attending that BRICS summit, uh, as well as Mauritius. There'll be a stopover in Mauritius. Um, how closely will this visit be watched by other countries as well in Africa? Yes, Anand, uh, it's true. Um, China-Africa relations, uh, you know, is turning 18 this year. Uh, that means we have uh, developed quite a lot of uh, relation, a lot of capacity in the last 18 years. Um, I think China is also using this, um, the void that has been created after uh, the end of the uh, Cold War, literally in the 90s, to fill that gap. And this has, uh, China has done this uh, in a very good way and in a very good fashion. It had developed um, infrastructure, it has developed um, uh, tremendous trade relations with a lot of African countries. But importantly, what I think uh, matters is since 2013 is, of course, China's um, outbound, um, uh, going out and outbound um, activity that is coined as a Belt and Road Initiative that uh, plays a huge role um, for African countries, but also for China, especially East African countries are really uh, benefiting from this development. And this trip, what we see right now, is, um, is going towards uh, West Africa, and this is the first time that we see it especially with uh, uh, visiting Senegal, a francophone country. Uh, we are seeing an outreach from China also to enter the French-speaking African countries. So we see now a, a directional um, match uh, where we had Egypt in the north, but also South Africa in the south and then Ethiopia in the east. And now we have with Senegal most likely taking the coach airmanship of Fukak uh, starting uh, this year. Uh, so Afri China has been now uh, represented in all four corners of Africa, and this is, um, I think, it's, it's a tremendous success for China. Edmund, uh, during this visit, uh, the president started out uh, in the United Arab Emirates, um, and thereafter he's traveling to these African countries. How big and significant are Chinese ties with the Middle East? I think they are growing. They are very significant, especially in the UAE. The UAE has uh, the second largest economy in the Gulf, but it is the largest partner in that area uh, of China. And this relationship started uh, really almost four decades ago during the first visit uh, by a Chinese leader to the region. But I think this visit is extremely important also because this is the first time uh, you had the president uh, who the first visit to any country by after his election uh, and I think there is a symbolic significance the uh, President Xi wrote a very interesting article in one of uh, the local papers in the UAE where he talked about the, the common interests common vision or common philosophy for the two sides and also the compatibility of interest to a certain extent as well as uh, the, uh, that both countries are very, they have people who are serious, who are interested in development, who want to grow their economy. And also he spoke of the UAE and this was very interesting as an oasis of development in that part of, uh, uh, of the world and as a model for the Arab world. So he was speaking of course to the UAE, the fact that he chose to the, the UAE is very significant. Uh, because of the economic relationship and it's uh, really multifaceted. You have energy, of course. Uh, you have now the development of clean energy, solar power. Uh, you have uh, Dubai ports uh, cooperation. You have investments. You have areas of education as well as uh, culture. Something very interesting that has happened, for example, there was a week of uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Chinese cinema and uh, showing Chinese films in uh, the UAE. There was also a book fair. They translated one of the works of uh, President Xi to Arabic last year, and that's I thought was very interesting because I didn't know that. Uh, that uh, there was a book fair in, uh, uh, in uh, Dubai, and there were 400 right. uh, works translated from Chinese to Arabic. Right. Uh, so that also shows that there is interest in Chinese ideas, yeah. Chinese culture, Chinese things, because in a sense, some of the same problems that China faced, yeah. the region, the Arab world is facing, and so that experiment of China, how China was able to overcome its problem. China also has something, and this is something similar to what Abdullah was mentioning, which is very significant. China does not have a colonial history in that part of the world. Unlike many of fr France, Britain, uh, it's, not, it's perceived as not a country that's seeking hegemony. Yeah. And in this, this is a significant advantage for, for China. And at the same time, uh, they, the way they operate also is a little bit different from how Western countries have in the past operated. Well, it's a point that Abdullah exactly. made that there are no conditions placed on the relationship uh, between China and those countries. Uh, Chen Chen Chen, looking at China's involvement in Africa, I mean, it's not without its detractors. There are critics who describe China's relationship with Africa as neocolonialism, that China is getting these countries to take on too much Chinese debt, that it's draining African resources, natural resources. President Xi has refuted these critics, but what do you make of it? Okay, uh, Anand, I think the, uh, uh, those rhetoric about the so-called neo-colonialism of China uh, has been cliche, actually. It's more about uh, the strategic suspicion rather than talk about specific tangible issues. Uh, take the debt issue in Africa, for example. Uh, actually, the debt issue was not created by China. Uh, it dates back to uh, 1950s to 1970s when African countries raised huge uh, funds from uh, back then very powerful, influential Western financial institutions. Uh, but the, in terms of trade, those African countries back then suffered from huge price and scissors uh, when they were conducting trade when, uh, with Western uh, powers. Uh, so nowadays, if you compare the scale of debt with back then, uh, if you take into consideration the scale of in industrialization nowadays, you can, say, you can see that the scale of debt is actually under control, it's controllable. And what's more important is that in later decades of those debt issues, uh, uh, countries like the United States, they tried to uh, relieve the debt issue uh, through executing certain uh, debt relief plans uh, those plans worked to a certain extent, but until today, the debt issue hasn't been solved. What is most important nowadays is that the uh, local countries should be guaranteed with this, uh, independent decision making, as you just mentioned, uh, no added conditions. They have to stimulate the internal vigor from inside. That's the only way out, and that is exactly the uh, China approach on the African continent. So I think the uh, uh, you cannot underestimate the independent decision making uh, uh, because when you look into the Belt and Road up projects between yeah. China and African countries, you can see uh, the uh, independent rounds and rounds of negotiations. So I think that's the uh, very key message, the message of uh, respect for mutual benefit and the respect of equality. Anand. Alexander, what do you make uh, of those critics who say that China's outreach is tantamount to neocolonialism? Yes, um, usually uh, we ask for um, proof <laughs> and uh, most of the time uh, you will receive some blank answers or blank faces. But uh, what we need to know and what, need, what we need to be careful here is um, where the money that is coming from China is uh, being spent. So if you as an African country take the money uh, from China and spend it on non-productive uh, assets or non-productive sectors, then of course this debt will be on the long term be negative uh, for, the, for the recipient country. But what we uh, are seeing in Africa, most of the African countries, at least those that are growing uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly in the last years, they are putting this money in uh, critical infrastructure that has not been developed in the last years. 
uh, they are developing so-called special economic zones, uh, which help attract uh, investment to the countries, Ethiopian being a case here. But also countries like Rwanda are uh, stepping up in that direction, uh, but also Senegal is, is taking those examples. So it depends where the money goes, and as long as the Chinese money, as I call it, goes to productive uh, sectors, then we are perfectly fine. And if you look at the debt to GDP ratio in many countries in Africa, uh, sometimes they are even better off than some European countries so the debt issue is really is, is a biased discussion and we need to be very careful on that okay we are gonna take a break right now coming up China is investing heavily in Africa how will it pay off for both sides plus we preview the BRICS summit in Johannesburg stay with us you're watching the heat